Hello, my name is Vince Davis, and I'm the Annual Cropping Systems Weed Science and Extension Specialist in the Department of Agronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I want to talk about the importance of rotating herbicide sites of action and how it helps mitigate herbicide resistance, the how and the why. And to do that, we first have to understand what resistance is. So we're going to get into that. I just want to show a few pictures of herbicide resistance. Here's, here's just some examples of the situations we want to avoid, like horsetail in soybeans here, or horse weed, I'm sorry, and more horse weed in soybeans. I've, I've seen a lot of these situations firsthand, and these are the types of situations we want to avoid uh, with herbicide resistance, and some of these can be very devastating. Here's an example of, of giant ragweed in corn. Um, not only does it show its competitive ability, which we talked about in another training segment, but it just shows uh, a number of things that we don't want to get into this scenario or situations like common water hemp here that is now resistant to six herbicide modes of action so we want to understand this why does this happen how can we avoid this and diversity and rotation of herbicide modes of action is very important uh, to that you can learn a lot more about the importance of diversity uh, management tactics um, and a lot more about herbicide resistance at at the Take Action on Weeds uh, website. So that's www.takeactiononweeds. And uh, the United Soybean Board has sponsored this initiative to understand the four pillars of herbicide resistance, like weed out resistance uh, in the field, spray attention, and the bottom line. So I'm going to be talking about some of these uh, important practices here. Um, in another segment, I talked about the uh, herbicide classification understanding how herbicides work and understanding how the different modes of action work are very important and one of the reasons we want to understand that is to be able to rotate those sites of action and rotate those modes of action so we create that diversity in our cropping systems to avoid herbicide resistance and we're going to get into why that is so let's first define resistance um, let's first off define susceptibility susceptibility is um, where you expect injury or plant death for all of the weeds in a population at the acceptable use rates of a particular herbicide. Tolerance, on the other hand, is where a herbicide never really was fully uh, uh, effective against that particular herbicide or population. And so where we have the interaction here is resistance. So resistance is a change in a plant population from a population that is initially susceptible to a population that is predominantly tolerant. So it is the loss of effectiveness of a herbicide due to the evolution of resistance in the weed population. So it's something that develops over time and usually because of a change, it could be a single site of action or multiple site of action change over time to plants that are that are not controlled that takes over an entire population. So weeds become resistant by uh, a population that equilibrates with a new biotype that can uh, withstand that herbicide application. That biotype may have an altered site of action. It may have enhanced metabolism. It may have uh, reduced uptake either through foliar or roots. It may have reduced translocation, so once the herbicide is in the particular weed, it may be compartmentalized or sequestered, or something else may happen where it, it gets in the plant but does not get to the site of action where it's going to be effective, or there can be some other mechanisms out there that we don't know as well. But what I want to go over is, is what happens. It's important to understand that the herbicide itself is not a does not cause a genetic mutation. Okay, so the genetic mutation that allows that plant to withstand the herbicide is already out there in nature, but what we do to create an entire population that is resistant is we continually select for that uh, one mutant plant that can tolerate that, we continually select for that, and that increases in numbers over time. So it is an evolutionary process. There's a number of different factors that can influence that evolutionary process. Some of those we 
um, have influence on through management, some we don't. So a couple of those that we don't are the mutation rate. So how often will mutations to withstand the herbicide occur in particular species is important. And then the fitness or the survivability of those mutants are really important. So biotype fitness. Those are factors of population genetics which are very important uh, in determining the speed at which resistance will occur or develop in a population. But we as managers have less effect on those things. Those are biological traits that we can't really control. However, uh, population dynamics and selection pressure are the areas that also have a lot of uh, influence on the speed at which herbicide resistance develops and management does influence these two particularly selection pressure so the amount of selection pressure or the number of times you do a repeated application or a repeated practice of the same thing is is going to determine how quick at which you find a particular plant uh, biotype that can survive that repeated uh, action you put on it is, is uh, what's really most important to avoid from a management perspective. Uh, what's really important here is that is then to understand if selection pressure is the most important thing. It's really a numbers game. Um, there's some publications that, that demonstrate this. A good example is to just think about, and I'm, I'm really going to, I'm really going to, try to simplify this. This is probably going to be way oversimplified, but I'm going to simplify this to just put this in terms of numbers so it's a little bit easier to understand. If we think about a mutation rate of 1 times 10 to the negative 6, or 1 in every 1.5 million, in some ways 1 to 1.5 million would seem like a rare event. Okay. So if, if we approach this with that in mind, that one to one and a half million is somewhat of a rare event um, in some ways, that, that will help us put this in perspective. So now if we think about one weed per acre to every one and a half million acres, again, that still kind of seems like a rare event. But a lot of the weeds that we deal with or we try to control in crop production is uh, a lot more abundant than one per acre. Okay, um, that would be way below the threshold we deal with. So uh, a little bit more along the lines of the threshold we deal with might be five weeds per square yard. That would match uh, the weed density of a lot of weeds that we actually do try to contend with. And at five weeds per square yard, that one to one and a half million ratio is going to occur every 62 acres with a weed at that level of density. So that all of a sudden makes something that might have might seem rare not rare at all okay so let's keep these numbers in mind so the question then to be to think about is how rare would a resistant mutant have to be to avoid resistance evolution if we provide the same selection pressure on 74 million acres and that's really the experiment we've been running because 74 million acres is just the the amount of Roundup Ready soybean acres nationally and we have been uh, using glyphosate repeatedly on those acres as a single source for for too long and that's why we're now seeing more and more glyphosate resistant weeds and it's the same principle that we've seen other herbicide resistant weeds as well so to limit and and, and slow the development of herbicide resistance we have to uh, continually limit that selection pressure and mix up the population genetics or mix up that selection pressure. And so one thought here is just to run through a scenario. If we go back to that 62 acre field, if we spray that with let's say herbicide X and one plant is resistant to that herbicide X, and let's say that one plant produced 300,000 seeds, and let's just pretend that only 1% of those 300,000 seeds will actually produce progeny that will germinate and emerge and, and go to seed again the next season. So uh, we're assuming 99% of those 300,000 seeds are just going to disappear through predation or through some other management tactic. Maybe it's burial in a tillage system or something else. That next season, now 
you have the, uh, the, the option to spray that herbicide X again or maybe spray a different herbicide. We'll say herbicide Z. If you spray herbicide X again, but what you're trying to control are now 3,000 plants that are able to um, uh, resist herbicide X, and those 3,000 plants all produce 300,000 seeds again, and we again only assume 1% of the progeny from those 3,000 mothers actually establishes plants in the next crop, which will only be the third season, you realize you now have 9 million plants on the 62 acres in only three seasons that are now resistant to herbicide X just from two years of selection pressure uh, by relying on that same herbicide program. However, if you were to use herbicide Z, and then we say herbicide Z is 99% effective, it'll be a different shuffling where, where only 1% uh, of those 3,000 uh, might survive and go to seed, and that would limit it uh, from uh, uh, three, limit it from nine million uh, seeds being produced to only 300,000 seeds being produced in that rotation. So this it, just kind of a simplistic way to think about the numbers and how quickly a population can shift just from a couple rounds of selection pressure um, on, on an event that would be as rare as one to one and a half million and that's with the assumptions that, that a lot of seeds disappear in that system. So it's, it's somewhat of an oversimplification, but this is the reason why we want to rotate herbicide sites of action. Now, another thought in essence of selection pressure is to um, uh, think about uh, it, it, selection pressure because it's a numbers game it's not only about the number of times you spray a herbicide on the system or on the crop, but how many weeds you're exposing it to. So what I want to point out here is this, th this is data that was taken from uh, an experiment that Dr. Dave Stoltenberg conducted over eight years um, that demonstrates three scenarios where we have field one where glyphosate was applied each year and field two where glyphosate was applied in alternate years and field three where glyphosate again was applied each year but it followed a pre-emergence herbicide that was effective for certain weeds so where dual was applied every year you can see we have three predominant weed species in in all of these scenarios we have foxtail pigweed and lambs quarters um, here listed uh, down this left hand column and what you can compare is in field one and field three glyphosate was applied every year but in field one 388 million foxtail were exposed where field three only 8 million foxtail were exposed because 380 million were essentially controlled by the dual two or the metolachlor at, at the at the pre application even though glyphosate was applied the same number of times now in field two glyphosate was only applied half as often as it was applied in scenario three but there were still ten times more foxtail exposed to that glyphosate application um, because not using the dual two magnum in the pre-situation was not as effective as an alternate alternative control mechanism as using the dual two. So the importance of this slide right here is to show you that selection pressure is driven by the number of times a herbicide is applied in a system, but it's also driven by the effectiveness of the other alternative control mechanisms you put in place to rotate with the reliance on that glyphosate or the reliance on any other post or any other single uh, control tactic um, that we're talking about not just glyphosate but it's about uh, using multiple effective um, mechanisms for alternative weed control and not reliance on one particular thing
So the, the take home message in this to avoid herbicide resistance is, is that you got to know your target weed and you got to rotate herbicide modes of action with overlapping effective weed control. And so that's the point I really want to drive home is, is that that alternative weed control has to be effective to whatever uh, the weed control is you're most concerned about resistance. So use multiple effective MOAs through tank mixtures is, is also an, an option. Use multiple effective modes of action in sequential herbicide applications like pre-emergence followed by post-emergence. Use herbicides with, with low risk of resistance where possible. Um, rotate crops to um, help uh, uh, continually change the, the, uh, uh, which weed species become most problematic. And most importantly, uh, scout for weeds that escape herbicide control. That is another benefit to use in pre-emergence or uh, residual herbicides is that you have a greater opportunity to control the weeds that escape that first control uh, mechanism and use mechanical control where environmentally feasible to again use other uh, cultural practices or mechanical practices and not just rely on herbicides every time. Now what to look for is also really important with resistance because most of the time resistance is not detected until there is a large problem and what I mean by that is the first few escapes is it's easy to not notice those but as you can see through the scenario after only one or two seasons of that resistant plant being uncontrolled it can increase in numbers very very quickly so the early warning signs to be aware of is where only one weed species escapes control um, that that can be very problematic uh, where plants have a very wide range of response to the herbicide oftentimes with resistance you'll see dead plants right next to alive plants and especially look for uh, large dead plants next to small alive plants um, uh, that can be a good indication that that the, the smaller plants have resistance genes in them um, if they're able to withstand the application that larger plants can't often uh, withstand and then the arrangement of weed escapes in the field are very important to match to field equipment width so you want to rule out escapes uh, because of boom skips or boom overlaps um, certainly so if you see weeds that are that are more scattered throughout the field and don't necessarily match to boom widths or boom escapes boom gaps that sort of thing they can be more uh, problematic or questionable for resistance uh, development early on to learn more about resistance again um, in one of the other segments I talked about the Weed Science Society of America website but on the Weed Science Society of America website there are five uh, very in-depth lessons of understanding herbicide resistance and I would encourage you if you want to learn more about this subject to go check out these modules as they are uh, very in-depth and important so with that I thank you for uh, understanding or going over the principles of herbicide resistance with me.